Okay, so any questions before we begin? Now, if you remember, last week we had started discussing rotations. We were discussing about the angular velocity, angular acceleration. This was the angular velocity, angular acceleration. We had talked about the kinetic energy of rotation. We had shown that kinetic energy of a rotating object we could write as 1 over 2 i omega squared. And I was analogous to the mass in the translational motion, and it was defined as the sum over all the masses making my system of this quantity. And, well, basically this was it. And we had also seen the correspondence between rotations and the linear translational motion. Angular velocity was quite analogous in terms of mathematical expressions to the linear velocity, angular ex acceleration was similar to linear acceleration. Displacement, angular displacement was quite similar to linear displacement. At least, again, as I repeat, in terms of the equations that they, are, they satisfy. And we also discussed about the cross product of vectors. If we had two vectors, A and B, the cross product had a magnitude, which is the product of the magnitudes times sine of the angle between the two. And using this convention, the, the direction of the, uh, this cross product, since it's a, we define it as a vector, this is the magnitude. We also have to specify its direction. To specify the direction, we use what we call the right-hand rule. We just imagine that if this is our vector A, this is our vector B. A cross B is, we were imagining the vector A rotating towards vector B. So this is the rotation. So using the right-hand rule, your fingers in the direction of the rotation, then your thumb points in the direction of the cross product. So the direction is determined by the right-hand rule. Now, this right-hand rule also allowed us to determine the direction of the angular velocity. You remember the linear velocity is actually a vector in the three dimensions. But this, the angular velocity, we could also define it as a vector. And the direction of this vector, again, we determine using the right-hand rule. So if you have any object, let's say this one, it is rotating. What is the direction of the angular momentum, uh, angular velocity now? Right, your, take your right hand, curl it in the direction of rotation, your thumb points in the direction of the angular velocity. Now it is rotating faster, what is the direction of the angular acceleration? It's in the same direction because the angular velocity increased in this direction. Now any questions on any one of these, the, direct, the right hand rule, the direction of the angular velocity, angular acceleration, etc. natural. And, okay, on Thursday, we spend our time on mainly kinematics. How do we describe the rotation of motion? And we had all these kinematical variables, and we uh, studied the kinetic energy. How can we, well, kinetic energy of rotations is nothing but the kinetic, when you have this rotating object, it is nothing but the sum of the kinetic energies of each one of the parts making my system. And now, now today we will be mainly concentrating on what changes the angular velocity, what causes angular acceleration. This angular acceleration over here, which changes the angular velocity. Well, we basically have an idea of what is the reason. So if you have this object, if you exert some force here for some time, then we know that there will be some, uh, it, will be, it will start rotating and hence it should have some angular acceleration. And we also know that if we exert the same amount of force over here, then it basically doesn't rotate. It is quite easy to rotate over here, but not so easy to, rot to accelerate the object if I push it from here. 
So now today we will understand also why this happens. Now let's start with a simple example. As usual, as always, we always start with simple examples and go to co more complicated cases. Now, at the moment, we don't know what causes the acceleration of all the masses making this rigid body. But we can imagine a simpler rigid body. This is, let's say, this is our rotation axis. Now we have a massless rod, and at the end of this rod, there is some mass M, a point mass. And we exert some force, let's say, in this direction. So we can choose some coordinate axis, but you can choose whichever one you like. So let us choose one, one axis along this road, the other axis perpendicular to it. Let us also call this angle theta. Let's say this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. And you are just free to choose whichever coordinate you like, whichever axis you like. So I just prefer to choose it in this way so that at least one of the forces acting on my mass is along one of the axes. Now, what are the forces acting on my mass? Gravitation. Ignore gravity. We are in empty space. There is a tension. The rod has a tension. And, and there is a force. So what is the force vector? Well, this is the this is the force vector. What about the force due to the tension? T in the minus x direction. So we can just write the total vector to be minus T minus F cosine theta in the x hat plus F sine theta in the y hat. This is the total force vector acting on my mass. So you see there are two components of the total force. One is in the radial direction, that is the x direction. It points towards the center of rotations. Since this is a rigid rod, the object will be making some circular motion. Not necessarily uniform, in fact, definitely not uniform, because it will also have a, there is a tangential force acting on my mass, and hence it will have a tangential acceleration. So what will be the tangential acceleration? What is the tangential force? The force, the component of the force in the tangent direction, with it, which is the, nothing but the y direction. So the tangential acceleration is F sine theta over the mass. OK, this is the tangential acceleration that we obtain using just linear translate the dynamics we had studied until now without referring to any rotation. But the object will be rotating, that's also we know. So what is the angular acceleration of this object? What can you say about the angular acceleration? Remember, on Thursday we also related the angular velocity and the linear velocity. We said that the linear velocity of an object was nothing but omega cross r And so the, ang the tangential acceleration of the object in vector form, it was alpha cross r. Or we can also say that a tangential is equal to alpha times r. r is the distance of the object from the center, rotation axis. So you see alpha, the ang we already know the tangential acceleration of this object. So the linear acceleration of the object is the tangential acceleration divided by, let's call this length r, divided by r. So this is f sine theta over m times r.
Now, any questions up to this point? We, we basically use the dynamics for point objects. Now, also, we would like to write everything in terms of vectors because this sine theta, it will change whether we choose one coordinate axis or some other coordinate axis. And even this expression will f sine theta its expression will, should change if we choose some different coordinate axis. But vectors themselves are independent of the coordinate axis. So that's why we would like to relate everything in, write everything in terms of vectors. So I have to somehow convert this f and sine theta into some expressions that we can write in terms of vectors. So which expression that we use, we can write using vectors contains the magnitude of a vector and sine of an angle. Now, vectoral product. So let's say this is my vector r. This is the position vector of my object. Let us look at the vector product of f cross r. What is the magnitude? Remember, this is the definition of the cross product, the magnitude of the cross product. The product of the magnitudes times sine of the angle between the two vectors. So what is the cross product, the magnitude of this cross product? F times capital R, which is the magnitude of this position vector, and the angle between the two. Well, to, to figure out the angle between the two, what you should do is you should just carry this vector, these two vectors, so that their endpoints are the same. If you just carry them, you see that theta is the angle between the two, two vectors. <coughs> times sine of theta. So we see that f times sine theta is nothing but f cross r magnitude divided by r. Or if you just put it over here, alpha is equal to f cross r magnitude divided by m times r squared. Or, written in another way, m times r squared times alpha is equal to the magnitude of f cross r. Now, what is the moment of inertia of this system? You see, we have this point mass. This is my point mass. It is rotating around an axis, but the shape of this thing doesn't change, so basically it's a rigid body. I can talk, although it's a point mass, I can still talk about its moment of inertia for rotations around this point, around this axis. It will be a Mars squared. You see, if you remember the definition of the moment of inertia, this is how we define it the moment of inertia, m times r squared summed over all the point masses making my system. Now, in this case, my system is just a single point. So there, in the sum, there's just a single term. To calculate the moment of inertia, I multiply the ma its mass with its distance from the rotation axis. Now, the distance from the rotation axis is nothing but this large r squared. So what we see is, for the angular acceleration, I times alpha is equal to the magnitude of F cross R, or let's say R cross F. Now this quantity, R cross F, well, let's also see the direction of R cross F. Now, what, what's the direction of the acceleration, acceleration of this object at this instant? What is the direction of the acceleration? It will be accelerating, well, not really the y. It has a tangential acceleration given by this one, well, x sine theta over m but it also has some circular acceleration. So its acceleration will be some, if this is the y-axis, its acceleration vector will be somewhere like this. 
There is a tangential component. There is also the radial component, because it's doing circular motion. Now, what is the direction of the angular acceleration vector? So you see, although it's a point mass, let's just look at this wheel. Let's say at this instant, it is at rest. It might be moving, it will not really change. Then I exert the force over here in that direction. In this problem, it is, let's see. My, mass, my force is exerting over here, and the direction is somewhere like this. So this is the direction of the force that I will exert. In which direction did it start to move, rotate? What's the direction of angular velocity? Towards you. So initially, it had zero angular velocity. After I exerted the force, its angular velocity was towards you. So what is the direction of the angular acceleration? It is towards you. So the direction of the angular acceleration that this force creates will be towards you. What is the direction of R cross F? So you see, this is, this is R. This is the direction of F. This is R, this is F. Now, to calculate R cross F, I have to imagine this vector R rotating towards F. So if this is rotating like this, towards, that, towards you. So you see, here we have two vectors, I times alpha and R cross F. I is something positive. We know that I times alpha is pointing towards you. R cross F is pointing towards you. Furthermore, their magnitudes are equal. So if two vectors have the same magnitude and same direction, then they are the same vectors. Is equal to R cross F, which is nothing but the torque. Now, just to compare, compare this with m times a is equal to f. It's the analogous expression. The moment of inertia in rotations plays the role of the mass in linear motion. Angular acceleration plays the role of the linear acceleration. The torque is what plays the role of the force. So if there is a torque acting on a system, that means there is an angular acceleration acting on my system. And almost all the conclusions we have about the, uh, the force and the acceleration, they still hold for torque and the angular acceleration. Now this also, <coughs> the, the, if you look at the definition of the torque or the magnitude of the torque, it also explains us why it is easier to cause an object to rotate if you exert a force at this point rather than at this point. Because even if you exert the same force on an object, object even if you exert the same force, if R is larger, then you will be exerting a larger torque on the object. So if I, if I exert the same force here, I will be creating a larger torque than if I would do it over here. So that's why if I push it from this point, there is a larger angular acceleration than, than there would have been if I pushed it from here. <coughs> now furthermore, let's say that I am exerting the force at a given point on my object with a, a given magnitude, the direction also makes a difference. So if you exert the force per, in this direction, the torque will be largest, but if you exert it in the opposite, in the radial direction, there is no torque created. So the, these three factors will affect how much torque a force creates. Its magnitude, the distance that it is applied. You see, when we were discussing the translational motion, we just ignored the fact that the force might be exerted at one point or another point. So we didn't really pay attention to whether I was pushing it from this point or from this point. It didn't make any difference. But we see that in rotations, it is important at which point you are exerting the force. 
So the, the large, further away you are from the rotation axis, the more rotation effect it will have. And also the direction, again, in this case is also important. Now, any questions up to this point? Uh, I don't really understand. Uh, what don't you understand? Uh, what is force? Well, it is just like the force. I mean, what, was what is force? Uh, Newton's second law basically defines what is force. Force is anything that causes acceleration. Torque is analogous. The torque is anything that causes angular acceleration. But the torque and the force, they are related. They are not independent quantities. The force of acting on an object, it creates a torque. Other questions? Now, of course, this was this, this final result that we have, I alpha is equal to the torque, is valid for a point mass. If you look, uh, because our derivation was based on, on the fact that it's a point mass. If we have a point mass, there is a force acting on it, we, can, we could calculate the angular acceleration and we could write it in terms of a new quantity that we call the torque, which we define as R cross F and the moment of inertia. And this is analogous to Newton's second law in linear motion. Here we have Instead of mass, we have the moment of inertia. Instead of linear acceleration, we have angular acceleration. Instead of force, we have the torque. So once you are given the force of acting on a system, well, you can calculate the acceleration of the center of mass. And now we know how, once we, are, we know the forces, we can calculate what, how much torque they create. And from that information, we can calculate their acceleration. Of course, in this case, it won't be enough to know the total, force act, the total force acting on my system, but I also have to know what is the magnitude at which point the forces are acting. Now, if we generalize this to any rigid body, suppose this is our rigid body. It is rotating around this axis. Now, we already said that we can imagine it into a collection of point objects There might be forces acting on different points. Let's say this is force F1 at the point R1. This is force F2 at the point R2. This is force Fi at the point Ri. Now the total torque acting on my object will be nothing but the, tor the sum of the torques created by each one of these forces. And we can also write down the moment of inertia. It is just sum over all the different point masses making my system. Let me say this one d. dj is the distance of mass mj from rotation axis. Then if we know the total torque, if we know the moment of inertia of the system, then I times alpha will be equal to the total torque acting on my system. This will be always true. Now let's do some examples. Let's imagine we have this wheel, which is rotating around this around its center.
it radiuses R. Do you remember this moment of inertia? M times R squared, because we know that the definition of the moment of inertia is MI times DI squared. Now, the distance of all the points on my wheel is at the same distance from the center. So this is MI R squared. So the moment of inertia is just M times R squared. This is the moment of inertia of my wheel. Now, let's say that we exert a force at this point in this direction, let's call this F1, we exert this, an opposite force in the opposite direction, let's call it F2, or let me even exert that force over here, F2. And let's imagine that F1, the magnitude, is equal to F2. They are in opposite directions. Now, what is the total force acting on my system? The total force, I'm not asking about the torque acting on the system. F1 plus F2. Now, when we are calculating the total force, the points at which they are being exerted, it's not important. So what is the sum? Remember, these two vectors are vectors pointing in opposite directions and that have the same <coughs> magnitude. So the total force is zero. What is the acceleration of the center of mass? How many of you think it is zero? How many of you think it is non-zero? Okay, those who think it is zero. Those who think it is non-zero. Why? This doesn't fit my mind. Why? Because when you pull it from there, and pull it, it will rotate uh, towards this direction, I think. Okay. <coughs> so what about the center of mass acceleration? It will rotate, that's for sure. But you see, rotation is determined by the torque. Nothing is fixed. It can just take this wheel. I mean, you see, I have been holding this wheel and exerting some force at this point. So I'm, when I, if I'm pushing here, I can, now if I'm pulling this one, this point, I can push this point. And assuming I exert the same forces, the same magnitude of forces at this point and at this point, what would be the acceleration of the center of mass? the same magnitude. The center of mass. Zero. Why? Because uh, we, we talked about it about uh, if you listen a second and you said that the center doesn't move. It's just a dream. Okay. No, you see, I'm asking for the acceleration at this instant. Of course, I mean, they, they will start rotating, okay? If you follow the motion, it will start rotating, and assuming I don't change the direction of the acceleration, what the, the motion will just, in fact, make this oscillation. But I'm asking for what happens at this instant. When the, this is the orientation of the wheel, I exert a force over here, downward, and I push it upward. There's no gravity. What is the acceleration of the center of mass? So you are saying that F1 does not contribute to the acceleration? No, no I mean, I'm just exerting a force over here, another force over here. There is nothing else exerting any forces, nothing else to fix it. There is no gravity, no drag, etc. Only these two forces. Okay, choose one.
No, the total force is F2, you mean? No, my reference point, let's say, is just at the center. At an instant, ignore gravity, ignore everything. This is at rest. I'm in a reference frame in which this wheel is at rest. I will always stay in that reference frame. And then in the next instant, I exert a force at the center in the upward direction and another force at, this, at the rim in the downward direction in the same reference frame. So what will be the acceleration of the center and center of mass in this reference frame? So they divide which one by m? F2. F2 over m, OK. Yes. So you are saying that, again, F1 will not contribute to the acceleration of the center of mass. How do you get on what you have in the board if you have the same magnitude in the direction? What about the acceleration? So because um, torque is dependent on the force, so it is No, I'm not asking for the torque. Angular, angular acceleration is zero. Yes. Okay, that's a zero plane. This is a rotating object. Doesn't it have any effect? So, the fact that this will start rotating will not have any effect. So you are saying that it won't have any effect. Okay. What is the what is, what is the acceleration of the center of mass? That is still the question. Let's concentrate on that one. The acceleration of the center of mass is zero. Okay. But you see, the acceleration of the center of mass only and only depends on the total force acting on my system. Whether it is rotating or not has absolutely no effect on the acceleration. So you see, the total force is zero, so the acceleration of the center of mass is zero. The center of mass does not accelerate. You see, if I'm holding it like this, if I exert a force over here, I have to exert the opposite force with my other hand so that it will not move. It will start rotating, but the center of mass will not move. Yes. True. Now, you see, <coughs> we, we will come to that. What happens when there is a translational motion, when the axis is being translated, and there is also the rotation. That will be the, our next subject. But for the time being, I just choose one reference frame, saying that, OK, so at a give, until a given point, this is at rest. I mean, the reference frame at which this is at rest. There are no forces acting on it. Then I exert these two forces. I'm still in the same reference frame. What is the acceleration of the center of mass? I'm not talking about the torque yet. No, you see, this equation, we are still only looking at the motion of the center of mass, it is valid. Whether there is F1 or F2, I mean, if there was no F2, <laughs> imagine this was on a frictionless surface, and then if I would have pushed it, there would have been some net external force given by this F1, the only force that I'm exerting, and the center of mass will be accelerated and the acceleration will be, would have been given by F1 over M. Whether the, my object is rotating or not, or the center of mass is accelerating or not, this equation over here is always valid. The acceleration of the center of mass is always given by the total net force acting on my system. Yes? Now, we will study what happens when the axis is also translating in probably in the next hour.
But what will happen is there will be both of them. It will both rotate and there will be a linear acceleration. Uh, rigid object assumption. Well, things get complicated if you don't look at rigid objects. Now, in this thing, in this conclusion, of course not. If you have, if if this was not a rigid object but just a bunch of collection of different independent objects, if you exert a force over here, another force over here, then of course, if it's not a rigid object, its shape would be changing. But nevertheless, this conclusion would be correct. The center of mass acceleration would still have been zero as long as we exert these two forces. Which, in which case? Okay. Well, let's, let's give it a try. Now, of course, I mean, depend, depends on which force you are exerting. You see, I can, this is my finger, I can just push it like this without changing its direction, or I can just push it like this, changing its direction constantly. It depends on how you exert the force. But the force doesn't have to change. And furthermore, again, I repeat, I'm just considering this moment. And the force will depend on how you exert it. Let's give it a try. It's always in the same direction, right? Well, not const continuous, but always, almost always in the same direction. Let's do another example. There, there was a force acting on this one, always in the same direction. Or let's give it another try. Well, no, this was not a good example, it was bouncing. So you want a force always acting at the same orientation and always in the same direction. What caused it to accelerate? Which direction was the acceleration? What is the direction of the friction force? The friction force was in that direction, and that is what causes the ball to accelerate. Now, we will study both of these motions in more, in more detail in the next hour, probably. No, in two hours. Yes? Now we will look at gravitational moments at the next instant, once we finish this example. Now there is a gravitational force, and the, the problem with the gravitational force is that it's acting at every point. So it's not, act, I mean, we, here we are saying that the force is acting on this point, but gravity is acting at every point. So what is the torque created by gravity? Now that we will study. Um, when you were rotating the wheel and you were moving, the center of mass was moving as well, right? True. Nothing. Okay, so let me give another example then. In this example, the center of mass will not move at the same time I am exerting a constant force at the same point all the time. Right? Well, there is friction force. The center of mass is not moving. So this is basically the system with gravity. The force is always acting at the bottom, one force. Another force is always exerted by my hand. And since I'm not allowing the center of mass to move, the amount of force that I have to exert should be equal to the, the force due to friction. But if there was no friction due to the ground and the force on, by your hand on the center of mass would cause the wheel to move? Right? Well, if there is no friction, then I don't even need to hold it with my hand because there won't be any force in that direction. So I shouldn't exert any force if there is no friction. Other questions? Okay, this is always one of the points that gets quite confusing. Whether the object is rotating or not, whether there is a torque on the system or not, the acceleration of the center of mass only and only depends on the net force acting on my system and nothing else. If the net force is zero, 
the acceleration of the center of mass is always zero. Now, of course, the fact that the net force is zero doesn't mean that the torque would be zero. This is, again, an example of where the torque will not be zero. Let's calculate the torque. This is my, my system. Let's say Z axis is towards you. Now, what is the torque due to the second force, F2? Why? If tangential component is zero, that's one way of looking at it. Or you can say that the angle between, well, the R vector is zero. It is acting on the center, on the rotation axis. So it's R cross F. Basically, R vector is zero in this case. It is acting right on the rotation axis. What about the torque due to one? F1 times R. What is the theta? Sine 90 is 1. So the torque due to the first, first vector is <coughs> F1 times R. No? And so what is the torque 1 vector? You see, we are talking about the vector. This is the magnitude of the vector. What is the direction? In the plus that direction. Again, take your right hand. OK, this is the position vector of the, the point at which the force is acting. This is the direction of the force. This is R. So R cross F. OK, this is R. This is F. R cross F. Just imagine this R vector to be rotating. R cross F. Sorry. This is, this is your R. This is your F. R cross F. It is towards you. I mean, what I see on the screen and what you see over there are different. So it's in the plus that direction. Okay, this is R, F, R cross F. This is the direction of the torque. What is the total torque? F1 times R in the Z hat divided by I. Whatever. And we had already calculated the moment of inertia the torque, no, this is not torque. This is the total torque, is the sum. F1 times R. So the angular acceleration is F1 times R over I, Z. We had calculated I. The moment of inertia is just M times R squared. So this is F1 over M times R in the Z direction. OK, the center of mass does not accelerate, but the object starts rotating around the axis. The center of mass does not accelerate because there is net for the net force is zero. Now, another point of confusion, your friend was keeping on telling, asking whether it was fixed or not. Now, if an object is fixed, it just means that there is a, something else which is exerting a force on your object so that the acceleration of, the of your object, the acceleration of the center of mass of your object is zero. That is what you mean by when you say something is fixed. So you say that, OK, this, this point is, edge is fixed over here. It just means that I'm, this thing here, I'm exerting a force, the net force acting on my wheel due to my hand and the table is to balance its weight. The weight the force due to its weight is downward, so there has to be some net force that I and the table are exerting in the <coughs> upward direction. Look, I am pushing it down, the table is pushing it up. So as long as the net force is zero, there will be no acceleration. And if it is rotating, 
So if furthermore, I exert some additional force in the horizontal direction, let's say like this from here, it means there should be some additional horizontal force exerted by something else to keep this object fixed. In this case, it's mainly my hand. So whatever the motion is, whether the object is fixed or not, they are all due to the forces acting on your system. Now, any questions before you go for a break? True. But uh, the circle is rotating. Okay, but true. There's a change of kinetic energy. Correct. But net force is zero. True. There's a board, but no force. Well, let's see. The thing that we should study. Torque created by gravity. Work done by a torque. The short answer to your question is when we were talking about the, the when we were calculating the work done, we were saying that the work is the force times the displacement. But that displacement is the displacement of the point at which you are exerting the force. Now in this example, there are two forces. F2. Now, what is the displacement of that point? Zero. So F2 doesn't do any work. And then there is this force F1. So let's say that we are assuming that F1 acts for a very short amount of time, so that this point is more or less over there. It's displaced very slightly, but nevertheless, it will be displaced downward. Well, if initially it was at rest, it will be displaced downward. So the, the displacement of that point with respect to the will be in the direction of the force, and hence this force does some work on my system, which gives my system its kinetic energy. So basically, it's not the net for in this case, it's not the net force that is relevant because the, the different points on my object are being displaced by different amounts. In that case, you cannot really talk about the work done by the net force. You have to calculate the work done by each one of the forces separately and sum them up. In this case, we will be able to write it in terms of the torque acting on my system. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, um, you said the net force acting on the system is zero, and you said it has the, the torque acting. Correct. So my question is that, that as you, there is no F2 acting, it's just F2. The torque is still with F1 part. True. What makes torque? How does torque really define it? Because it well, you see, hold on, hold on. Now, the, the thing is, up to now, we, had, we were only dealing with systems in which the axis of rotation was fixed. Now, so I will only accept questions with axis of rotation fixed. If the axis of rotation is moving, we will start it in the third hour, probably. Then keep your questions until then. I'm, I'm, no, I'm talking about the when it is fixed. But when you re if you remove F2, it will not be fixed. The center of mass will be moving, the rotation axis will start moving. So it will not be fixed if you remove F2. That's why I put this force F2. Okay, fixed. Yes. True. If F2 is not there, it will be accelerated. The axis of rotation will not be fixed. And furthermore, the point at which we exert the force F2 is also not important. You see, we, when we are calculating the total force, the total force is just the vectorial sum of the forces. I could have ex exerted the F2 over here, F1 over here, or I could have exerted F2 over here and F1 over here, still the center of mass will not move. The torque will, of course, be different in both cases, so the acceleration, angular acceleration will be different in these cases, in this one or in this one, but nevertheless, the center of mass will not move in both cases, as long as these two forces are of the same magnitude and in opposite directions. 
Any questions? Okay, see you after 10 minutes. <laughs>